everyone doing? Stupidity. Is stupidity. <laughs> so, um, Oakshire Brewery is one of our many sponsors who we're thank and we're, we're thanking sponsors often and frequently. But I'm just going to say one thing about that sponsor: they brewed a beer especially for this conference called Liquid Justice. <laughs> and so I just think we should all be thinking a little bit about the liquid world as well as the uh, solid food world in, in this conference. And Liquid Justice is one of my favorite beers of late. Okay, so with that, I'm going to get us started with this really exciting keynote that features four renowned researchers, scholars, who are also incredibly engaged and invested in the issues of this conference. And to do the sort of formal in introductions of these four uh, people who are distinguished guests of our conference, I'm going to turn things over to Alan Dickman, who is a, um, the head of environmental studies here and a, and a marvelous biologist. And with that, I turn it over to my colleague, Alan Dickman. Thank you, Allison. Um, so good afternoon and welcome here to this panel on sustainable agriculture and emerging issues in plant genetics. I'm really um, honored to be moderator for this panel today. And I really want to thank all of the sponsors, but especially the Wayne Moore Center for Law and Politics and Margaret. And uh, thank you. And Allison, um, really want to give a big thanks to Allison so from the very beginning and developing and envisioning this to carrying it out. I'm just amazed at the job she's done. So yep. thank you, Allison. <laughs> So yesterday evening, I understood our keynote speaker, Fred Kirschman, to say something like, um, our, our major task is not simply to change society, because it's going to change. Our task is to channel those changes so that they're uh, just, sustainable, and productive. And, and I think that especially with the topic of today's panel, that that is a really useful way to think about, about these issues. So the format for the panel is that each person will have 15 minutes to speak, and I've been empowered by Allison to, she put me right here, I have a stopwatch and, and, and things like this, so I'm going to prod people, but, so that's their deal, is that they're going to try to keep the 15 minutes, and then we're going to try to have time um, at the end, so please uh, think about questions, but save them to the end, and please keep questions very short, so we'll take questions at the end from the audience, we want to have time to do that, but please keep them short. So, um, We'll get started early, and that gives each of you an additional 30 seconds for your talk. <laughs> promise not to use the taser? I promise. Well, no, I don't promise. It depends how long over you go. But Our first speaker will be Charles Benbrook, who's chief scientist at the Organic Center. Chuck worked in Washington, D.C. on agricultural policy, science, and regulatory issues from 1979 through 1997. He served as the agricultural staff expert on the Council for Environmental Quality at the end of the Carter administration. Following the election of Ronald Reagan, he moved to the Capitol Hill in early 1981 and was the executive director of the subcommittee of the House Committee on Agriculture with jurisdiction over pesticide regula regulation, research, trade, and foreign agricultural issues. In 1984, he was recruited to the job of the Executive Director, Board on Agriculture of the National Academy of Sciences, a position he held for seven years. Several influential National Academy of Science reports were done in this period on the need for and aspects of sustainable agriculture. In late 1990, he formed Benbrook Consulting Services. Chuck has written many reports, books, and peer-reviewed articles on agricultural science, technology, public health, and environmental issues. He will talk today about true progress and false promises, separating the wheat from the biotech chaff. Every time I go and speak somewhere where I've sent that uh, brief bio and somebody reads it, I say, oh boy, never again. So here's, a, here's a about me. Um, I'm a lifelong deadhead. I raise rabbits, and I like nothing more than catching wild steelhead in the Grand Ron River with a light fly rod. That's what uh, turns me on. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to work through a, a, a lot of um, analytical ground. I think one of the things our community needs to do is step up its game uh, in the critique of the uh, conventional food system and something I've spent a lot of time at. And I'm going to try to share some of the things that we've learned. It's going to be fast, so um, grab a hold of the saddle. <laughs> Uh, obviously, there's a, a huge divide in the debate, and, and to be totally blunt, a, a, a deep well of animosity between the organic community and the biotech industry. These are 
reasons familiar to, I'm sure, just about everybody here for why this, uh, why we have gotten to where we are at in the debate. Uh, and there, there's a, a, a lot behind each of these reasons. Let's see, let me just skip one. Oh, okay. Um, one, one of the, there's a, there's a lot of righteous indignation in the system right now. Um, I, I have been berated and fiercely criticized for raising food safety issues surrounding uh, USAID food aid to Africa that was BT corn. I had the audacity to suggest that no one had ever tested giving BT corn to hungry African women who might be pregnant, uh, who might react to a straight diet with corn accounting for perhaps 60% of the calories in, in a, the diet of, a, of an African woman. Uh, I had the audacity to suggest that 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 poses a unique set of risks and perhaps uh, the U.S. government bore an obligation to investigate it before we uh, loaded up the ships and sent them south. This is the kind of quote that we encounter all the time now in the, the, the uh, uh, coverage of the biotech industry. In a world on pace to spawn 9.1 billion mouths to feed by 2050, the black magic of ag biotech offers the only apparent <laughs> prospect of salvation. Man. <laughs> well, that's a debatable notion. Um, I, I've uh, in, participated in a, in a number of debates now. This is uh, the one I'm most proud of. A uh, hostile ground uh, debate on the website of The Economist magazine against Dr. Pamela Ronald, and uh, I whipped her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think that it was because, uh, you know, I was so eloquent and insightful in my arguments, but basically I had the right side of the argument. The, the voting got so heavy at the end of this that it actually crashed to the server of the uh, website. So for, for anyone that really wants to a really uh, hard-hitting um, synopsis of this debate that's going on around the world, the whole transcript and, and about 700 comments are available. Just recently, uh, what, uh, a couple weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Holman Jenkins ran a pretty outrageous piece where he tried to connect the dots between the, uh, what was going on in Egypt and um, uh, food shortages and the USDA decision on, on uh, Roundup Ready alfalfa, and he had this line in, when the gauze of political correctness is peeled away, the battle here isn't about much more than keeping organic alfalfa, also known as hay, cheap. Well, that got my blood boiling, so I penned a, a, a letter, and um, I, I write a lot of letters to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and they rarely get published, but this one actually did. Let me just read the the second paragraph. Most experts not working for or aligned with the GE industry argue that it's the soil, not GECs, that will support the next green revolution. But their voices cannot compete with the chorus of PR and spin so capably advanced these days by the biotech industry. Uh, and to, to the credit of the journal, they actually published it. So I, I want to focus a lot on, on this last paragraph and what stands behind it. So what about the, the first green revolution? It's probably if we're going to try to create a new green revolution, we would be well advised to understand uh, more about what happened with the first one. The definitive analysis was done by Evanson and Golan and published in Science in, in 2003. And these are the basic findings. They broke it up into an early green revolution and a late. 17% uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the yield growth uh, came from breeding. 20% uh, of the overall growth in production came from area expansion, and it was intensification of inputs, fertilizer, pesticides, and water, that accounted for 63% of the overall growth in this early period of the Green Revolution. In the later period, uh, plant breeding played a much more significant role, accounting for 86% of the increased production. Almost no additional uh, production increase from area expansion and a 14% contribution from uh, intensification of inputs. But in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, obviously back then and still one of the areas of the world where it was most important to have a green revolution, it really didn't make much contribution. 
Uh, there was, in, in the words of Evanson and Gollin in Science Magazine, yield growth and, and uh, the, the new varieties made only minor contributions to production growth in both periods, the early and the late. And in their article in Science, they talk about some of the reasons why the Green Revolution flopped in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. A different mix of crops were important, the agroecosystems were very different, uh, lack of knowledge and science infrastructure in the region, uh, limited stocks of uh, local germplasm to work with, and institutional and political fail uh, failures. So what, what's going to drive the next green revolution? Uh, area expansion, not much. Uh, we all know what the environmental and climate change costs w will be if we uh, take out much more of the uh, rainforests in, in the tropics. Expand irrigation acreage, definitely not uh, an option. And if we can hold today's level of irrigation, as Fred pointed out, we're drawing down aquifers all over the world. If we can just hold today's levels, that will be a miracle. Uh, increased crop yields, absolutely. We can do a lot of increasing crop yields, especially in um, resource poor areas with degraded soils. Uh, change the mix of crops and foods. Of course, this has got to play a huge role in meeting world uh, uh, food needs. And uh, we're, I'm not going to talk about it today, but it's a, it's a critical topic. So if we're going to increase yield growth on a sustainable basis, where, how are we going to do that? Well, this is my synthesis of what, where I think the collective judgment of most agricultural scientists is uh, that have gotten together and talked about this. Um, so, you know, something like 20% from improved genetics, 45% uh, from improving the soil, um, enhancing soil organic matter, improving both catching water and efficiency of water use, maybe about 20%, and reducing um, insect pest damage and competition for water and nutrients from weeds, maybe about 15%. You know, we can all argue about these percentages. Um, Maybe some um, high in some areas, low in others, but it's something like this. So now let's take a look at the component parts. Increasing yields through plant breeding, crop genetic improvement, the topic of our panel. Where might this approximate 20% come from? Well, certainly better access to and utilization of existing genetics, varieties that are out there. It's going to play a role. Uh, expanding local and regional breeding uh, and, and the diversity and effectiveness of local seed industries, just that is going to make a significant difference. Uh, utilizing the new varieties that are coming out from uh, the CGIR system and, and national agriculture research systems uh, and exploiting uh, modern non-GE breeding techniques and in particular marker assisted breeding. Uh, it's very powerful tools that are going to accelerate uh, yield growth in, in many areas. And maybe, you know, at the end of the day, 3% or so from transgenics. So, you know, th this is, th this is the, the biotech industry is claiming that it's going to solve the world food problem with this maybe 3% of additional yield that they might be able to add. As, as, you, as, as I said before, I think improving soil fertility is where most of it's going to come from. Uh, I'm estimating 45%. And, and the source of yield growth from better soil is going to come from uh, off the farm, fertilizer, biological, uh, and organic inputs, uh, about 15%. Doing a better job of balancing nutrients. Uh, doesn't require any more nutrients, just using those that you have in a more effective way. And the real big opportunity, especially in areas with degraded soils, is rebuilding the organic matter content of soils. And, and, and so, uh, Building soil fertility, and, and by my estimation, can account for about 15 times the contribution of genetic engineering. Now, how uh, on the water side, uh, more efficient irrigation systems, um, e extending the growing season, storing more water, maybe we'll get 20 percent. Uh, most of you know about the basic goals of organic systems. They they're the, fun, you know, the fundamental uh, basis of organic farming is to build the soil with multiple benefits, water infiltration, holding more water, et cetera. This is, this is uh, familiar ground to all of you. If I had more time, I'd go over some of the data uh, out there about how successful building organic matter has been in parts of Africa. Um, and it, it's all about uh, 
uh, uh, organic matter, it holds more water, it holds more nitrogen. So it, it supports higher levels of yield without the farmer having to buy anything. So not only does it increase food production, but it also lowers the cost of production, which is why building organic matter is the best way to do economic development on small farms, because it allows the farmers to be responsible, more responsible for their production. Um, I think some, some reasonable goals, uh, I think organic matter can be built uh, you know, three tenths to one half of a percent uh, in, in a decade. There's several <laughs> projects that have accomplished it. And, and you know, maybe increase over three decades by 1%, the uh, average level of organic matter in most of the soils around the world would have a, a huge impact on food security. Um, I'm going to skip over this. This, this is how, you know, where you get the, the, or the organic matter to build the soil, um, because it takes, it takes a lot of tons to do it. Uh, but uh, I want to spend a few minutes uh, on, on this topic. Uh, the, the major promises uh, and claims of the biotech industry, uh, G, G technology increases yields, uh, reduces pesticide use, uh, increased farm income, uh, and GE crops are, are fully tested and safe. And th w one of the reasons there's so much uh, uh, tension in the system is that these claims and assertions are repeated so often and with such um, unequivocal uh, truth behind them from people that, that come from the biotech industry that you know, it, just, it makes a person not know really what to do if you actually know what the facts are. Um, None of the current GE crops were developed to increase yields. That was not, not the goal of the science. It's not the purpose of the technology. They're, they're all pest management related technologies. They're intended to make it easier to manage pests, not increase the intrinsic yield potential. Uh, Doug Green Sherman, a good friend of many of us, uh, had, did this great report. It came out not, not long ago. Uh, and it goes over all the, the reasons why basically it's a sham to argue that GE crops have increased yields. Um, the, and and uh, they, they all, the, the, the experimental GE crops that were supposed to increase yields uh, haven't performed well. And you know, we've been hearing about nitrogen fixing corn, for example, for, for over 20 years. And it's uh, not much closer today to, to actually uh, um, coming onto the market than, than 20 years ago. Have GE crops increased pesticide use up or down? This is, of course, a, an area that I've done four or five reports over the last 15 years. And the, the, basic, the, 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 the basic and unmistakable conclusion is that no, they, they have not. They did for a couple of years. The first two or three years, there was a minor uh, reduction. But in, in the ensuing years, every year, the gap has gotten bigger. And, so in the first 13 years of commercial uh, use of GE crops, uh, 1996 to 2008, herbicide tolerant crops have increased herbicide use by about 383 million pounds over what they would have been had conventional varieties and the best other uh, weed management systems been used. Uh, herbicide tolerant soybeans have accounted for most of the increase. Uh, BT crops have reduced uh, insecticide use. So those advocates of biotech, if, if they say that GE crops have reduced insecticide use, they can defend that statement. But if they say pesticides in general, then it's a false statement because pesticides encompasses both insecticides and herbicides. It's the resist, spread of resistant weeds that are driving herbicide use up. Uh, Mars tail, uh, volunteer corn in a soybean field. This is corn as a weed. And then this terrible new one, Palmer amaranth, uh, that's uh, taking over. Uh, we, we've had a return to chopping cotton in the southeast uh, with uh, crews of, of young, mostly African-American men being paid to go out into fields to chop these resistant weeds to try to save a crop. Uh, with all sorts of the spread of resistant weeds, it's, it's, it's a disaster that's unfolding in, um, uh, at a remarkably fast pace. It's going to be bad for the soil, bad for water quality, it's bad for the climate, and it's going to be, have a big increase in farm operating costs. Now, how about good for the farmer? Uh, well, uh, you know, basically, um, 
uh, not if you count what the seed costs. Uh, Roundup Ready uh, 2 soybeans uh, uh, cost 42% more in 2010 than in 2009. Uh, the seed ha the seed prices is, is 7.8 times the, the price of soybean grain. And historically, there was a relationship between the price of soybeans and soybean seed because a farmer could save the grain and plant it if he or she so chose. Outrageous run up in the cost of corn. We had the first uh, $300 plus bags of corn. Uh, corn farmers spending $125 for seed. Uh, to plant smart stack uh, eight GM trait corn uh, when 15 years ago conventional seed were, was costing the farmer about fifteen dollars. Uh, cotton seed up sixfold. The difference between GE cotton seed and conventional cotton seed in the U.S. on market today is six hundred percent. And then, in terms of the the hit on income. Uh, for, for soybeans, farmers in, in the pre-GE area spent 4 to 8 percent of their cash costs on seed. In the GE area in, in 2010, it's up to 23 percent. Same thing with corn, uh, 11 to 17 percent in the pre-GE era, up to 40 percent of, uh, of cash operating costs for that smart stack eight trait seed. Um, same thing with cotton, huge impact on uh, net income. And so th these are some of the, the consequences. We've got this move to multi-trait varieties where the farmers are having to pay for several traits that they don't want and don't need, but they have no choice because there's no there's not enough conventional seed to, to go around. My, by my estimate, about 20% of the historic net return per acre for corn, soybean, and cotton farmers in the United States has now been transferred the biotech industry, and that, that is a very significant historical, uh, uh, that will have historical consequences. Now right now farmers aren't bitching about it as much as they, they might be because, you know, corn, the commodity prices are very high. Cotton is at historic high prices, corn is way up, soybeans are way up. And that's it. Thank you very much. Chuck. Our second speaker is Ignacio Chapella. Ignacio is a mycologist and an associate professor of microbial ecology at the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management at the University of California at Berkeley. Ignacio is well known for a 2001 paper in Nature that reported the existence of transgenic DNA in wild maize in Mexico. He's been an outspoken critic of gen genetically modified food and biofuel crops founded the Mycological Facility in Oaxaca, which studies issues of natural resources and indigenous rights, and it is, is an advisory board member for the Sunshine Project, an organization promoting citizens' concerns with biosafety and biowarfare. Ignacio will talk to us about genetic engineering's new clothes and at least ask the question, can we exist with synthetic biology? Ignacio. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very little time and precious few opportunities to gather like we are here. So I will not use any time to thank all the people who need to be thanked and to express how happy I am to be here. Um, whenever we talk about transgenesis, and I will use the word transgenesis instead of GMOs, uh, we need to talk about boundaries and we need to talk about the boundaries that break down and that have been broken down uh, incrementally. I think we're trying to understand how it is that we went from a way of growing food and, doing, and dealing with plants and animals to a different way, how we went from this kind of uh, situation in a Chinampa in Mexico, still, still available today, uh, to this kind of situation. And I'm particularly interested today in finding out and talking and thinking with you about the role that this thing we call technology plays in it mechanical technology, chemical technology, biological interventions that might or might not be called technology. I believe genetic engineering is not a technology and we can discuss why. But the interventions into that world through this thing we call technology. And uh, how that technology um, 
it impact those boundaries that uh, we need to think about. Uh, we will hear, I'm sure, from Steve Jones in a moment uh, how we have used that technology to move from what used to be food and uh, transform it into what is a commodity. That, I believe that was a really important boundary that was crossed. And uh, oh, today we cannot talk about agriculture and we cannot talk about transgenesis especially if we don't recognize that there's that other boundary that is being uh, across, the boundary that existed before, uh, completely separate between food and fuel, that today is such an important problem. What kind of technology, what kind of technique, what method do people use to break those boundaries? And this latest boundary that I, I invite you all to become a, a, acquainted with is the boundary of turning food from, a, from, from food to a commodity to a, um, to a financial asset. The financialization of living things is, I believe, a very recent development that if you read uh, Frederick Kaufman's articles, I'm sure he'll be writing again this year, uh, but he wrote about the 2008 uh, uh, situation, you will realize how important that change from uh, into financialization of plants and animals um, like it was. I normally would have spent all my time talking and trying to talk about how the intervention through transgenesis doesn't work. So I'm really thankful that Chuck Bainbrook was speaking before me. Um, I thought I had to wear a tie to have enough authority to say it doesn't work and you would take it from me. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked. And the work that Chuck and Doug William Sherman have done showing that the yields don't go up and so on and so forth, I will not spend time with that. Simply take it from me. And yet, we continue to hear that amplified voice of many people who want to hear, to, to, who want us to have this intervention in our, in our lives, in our world. And I would like to uh, explore with you why. To find out why we continue to have this despite the fact that it doesn't work, we have to go back to this man, Vannevar Bush. And we have to go to him together with this other man. Vannevar Bush really acted like, in a way like an amanuensis, uh, channeling the great mind of this other man, the President of the United States, Roosevelt. Uh, uh, and for example, when Roosevelt uh, coined the term frontiers, frontiers of the mind, uh, Vannevar Bush pushed this idea that science was going to be the new frontier. Once we finished, once, once we reached Oregon and California, there was no more West for the West, right? So where is the new frontier to continue the path of progress, of growth, of unending growth? And uh, Vannevar Bush coined this idea that it would be through science and technology that we would move forward and continue um, the prog that progress, right? He wrote a one-page proposal uh, that he hand-delivered to FDR. And in this little piece of paper, FDR um, is writing to Vannevar Bush saying, OK. This little OK was the go-ahead for a very important project, a program that would transform history forever. Part of that program is called the Manhattan Project, but it's only part of it. Um, I, I want to note that uh, the, the interesting uh, nature of this piece of paper, how simple and, uh, and clean it is, and yet it belies the reality that this program would have two very important characteristics. One, it would be a national program, a very large program. And two, it would be secret, and it would be run by a, a few, a small number of people. Um, it says here, okay, returned, returned the, the proposal. I think you had best keep this in your own safe. Let's keep it between you and I. Manhattan Project is starting. Uh, from this point on, um, uh, it's a fantastic time for a, for a few uh, very lucky and very uh, happy men. I think it's entirely men. People have written about this. Uh, here you see them in Berkeley. This is one of our Bush. Uh, who were given really the strength, the force, the budget of the state, of the most powerful state in the world at that time, um, to play with their toys. And to promote this program, 
that really had two tracks, track A and track B. Track A was a track for inert matter, and track B was a track for living matter. These two tracks were there in their minds, in their writing from the very beginning. In that one piece of paper, it were, they were there. Um, inert matter lends itself very well to this kind of model, the idea that you can atomize it and extract, particularize, extract particles out of that, and through your understanding and your manipulation of those particles, do things with them, works. Uh, this is, and it continues to be with us, this is a, the current um, expression of that capacity to understand inanimate matter as particles, the uh, Large Hadron Collider that now straddles the boundary between Switzerland and France here um, running today. Um, but the script for that track A was written way before then. They knew really that it was going to work. It was really in the work of Rutherford, I think, that the, uh, that the, the premonition was uh, out there that this would work. So all they had to do was to do the work, make it large enough, put enough money, enough energy, enough uh, people working on it, and it would work. And so it's not surprising that soon enough, very fast, amazingly fast, they showed incontrovertibly that this project, Track A, works, right? This is Nagasaki, of course. And uh, if anybody has any doubts that that project works, you should go and ask those happy Belgians what it's like to be strolling around on a Sunday past their, their sources of energy, old and new nuclear power plants. So there's no doubt about it, track A worked. With the power that these men derived from being able to deliver on track A, they kept trying to deliver on track B. <coughs> And that's what we are living through right now. We're living through the idea that track A and track B actually move together at the same time. But when you hear, try to find out in biology, what is it that we have done? How is it that we actually uh, atomized and particularized that, that living matter in such a way that we could manipulate it? You get a really garbled story. I'm sorry to say that. And I think some of my biologist colleagues here might be a little, a little um, uh, offended by this maybe, but I think it's a really garbled story. It seems to be a story that has to do with this man and some finches or something to do with that, <laughs> or maybe it has to do with this man and some peas and <laughs> crossing and sex or something like that, or maybe it has to do with these men and the idea that, uh, that came out of them looking at that. By the way, uh, Watson and Crick did not discover DNA. Watson and Crick did not have anything to do with finding out that DNA had anything to do with passing on information and so on. I mean, um, somehow it seems like those three ideas are floating in the air and somehow we do have, have been able to reduce life to its component elements. What are the component elements of life? Genes? base pairs in the DNA sequence. People who are chasing the genome now have come to the conclusion that they have to stop imagining that they have genes or they have any of these particles and they have come up with something they call systems biology. In their definition, it is hypothesis-free science in which we will just accumulate numbers and data, A, T, Cs, and Gs, out of as many life forms as we can and out of that accumulation, some sense will come out of it. We are pretty lost. <laughs> so that when, time is up? No. So that by the time physicists were doing this, um, the same people, it's not that biologists are more stupid. I don't know. They were drawing a blank out here for some interesting reason. And this is, I went today to check out what they're saying at Cambridge about what they can do with this. This is the image that they put up. It's not my image. It's what they have on their website. This is the level of sophistication that we have in something we're calling synthetic biology. And let me read for you. Synthetic biology is an emerging field that employs engineering principles for constructing genetic systems. That means organisms, right? Um, the approach is based on the use of well-characterized and reusable components 
and numerical models for the design of biological circuits in a way that has become routine in other fields of engineering, and so on and so forth. They claim they have come up with the exchangeable parts and pieces that they can put in circuits, on a chassis, on a, uh, what they call them, a platform, and so on. They really don't know what, what they're doing. In the slightly more art-conscious uh, French-speaking world, this is what their image is, of this is about, synthetic biology. Somehow, through the tricks that you see illustrated in the back, turning living things into circuitry that one could understand and manipulate. Let me, let me uh, tell you, just like I said about plants, this is not working. We're pouring billions of dollars into this, literally billions of dollars, and it's not working. Why? Why do we continue to go with it? For those of you who have doubts about it, these are key words that I'm going to flash through if you're interested in pursuing some ideas. In any of these fields, you will discover reasons why this synthetic biology idea will not work, or we can predict it won't work. Uh, people to, to follow, um, part, interestingly, lots of women. And yet, we continue to do it. Why? Well, I, my claim in the last two minutes that I have, my claim would be that it's that we are caught on that track B. We have the inertia of a massive juggernaut that worked for something, but we cannot stop on the other, on the other end. And instead of calling it quits and say, look, it's not working, we just continue to pretend that it will work very much in the same way that we go into Ponzi schemes. So I'm thinking today and talking today, these days, about BioPonzi as the scheme that we're following, a scheme that we are willing to risk the world for. We decided to play with the world using this, and yet this juggernaut is not just simply Vannevar Bush and the federal government. It has become so integral of all the different components that make our productive system and our society. That includes not only the corporations. Corporations and Monsanto is really evil, and these companies are really bad. But they're not alone. They're, they're working in tight collaboration as part of this program, Track B, together with government, together with academic institutions, together with foundations, together with venture capitalists, and so on and so forth. This is called bundling, which in Italian uh, you would use the word fascist, right? <laughs> Um, to such an extent, and I just want to um, say that the level of, uh, of introgression, if you will, into the science-making enterprise, both governmental as well as uh, academic, is so deep that uh, individual scientists are finding themselves, finally, this is a very interesting uh, piece of research that, again, the Union of Concerned Scientists, not a university, uh, managed to get uh, scientists within FDA and USDA to talk about political influence, being silenced about what they know or what they see or what they do. And uh, you can see the numbers of respondents who say there are problems, that they are being influenced by politics. Um, it's not just the scientists at the bench or the people writing the reports. This is Dan Glickman. It's not only Republicans. It's not bad Bush and the bad Republicans at all. This is Dan Glickman, um, Secretary of Agriculture under Clinton, saying, what I saw generically on the probiotech side was the attitude that the technology was good and that it was almost immoral to say that it wasn't good because it was going to solve the problems of the human race and feed the hungry and clothe the naked. And there was a lot of money that had been invested in this, and if you're against it, you're Luddites, you're stupid. There was rhetoric like that, even here in this department. You felt like you were almost an alien, disloyal, by trying to present an open-minded view on some of the issues being raised. So I pretty much spouted the rhetoric that everybody else around here spouted. It was written into my speeches. This is your Secretary of Agriculture. These are not times to be playing with science. These are times when science would have to be as independent and as free as possible to allow us to deal with this kind of problem. And yet, this might be the time when science is most compromised by all these forces, by the buying out wholesale into that, uh, 
program track B. Um, I do want to end with, if I may, one more minute. I do want to end with a real life example from my home place uh, at Berkeley and a, a situation that arose recently last year after that um, uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, fire and disaster happened. Um, I don't know if you remember that. It happened in this country, although kind of far away from here. And a long time ago, right? And you know, you're not thinking about it because it's gone, because it, it cleared out. And if you have any doubt about it, there is actually a science paper that, uh, that showed, with all the scientists involved, that show that there are bacteria out there that nobody had ever seen that ate all the oil that came out of that BP. Um, so this is the science paper. This is immediately spun by Paul Wilson uh, of the New York Times saying, under sea oil plume vanishes in Gulf degraded by previously unknown bug, the Gulf of Mexico's under sea oil plume is no more. That was the first sentence in the article. These are the scientists who did this nice looking people um, and just this February the person who is in charge of putting out a statement about it says estimates that the Gulf should recover by the end of 2012 are in blah 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 maybe a few people will be hurt still and so on all based on the work of these scientists right what you do not see from this picture is that all these scientists are actually being paid by BP under the Energy Biosciences Institute, a tight, intimate agreement between BP and the University of California at Berkeley, the national labs. So just to say, we are putting all our, all, all our eggs in, our, in one basket. Uh, we are bundling where we should be diversifying. We're thinking of one program for everybody, one project for the world. We keep talking about how we should feed the world and I believe that it is really time that we change the way we, we think, and that will show by the way we speak. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen Jones. Stephen is a plant breeder and the director of the Northwestern Washington Research and Extension Center of Washington State University in Mount Vernon. His research on sustainable and organic systems has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Gourmet Magazine, National Geographic News, Discover Magazine, and on the PBS show Eyes of Nye with Bill Nye the Science Guy. <laughs> Recently, he authored the Sustainable Agricultural Entry and Wheat Entry for the World Book Encyclopedia. He has a PhD in genetics from the University of California at Davis and has been at Washington State University since 1991, where he developed some of the most widely grown winter wheats in the Pacific Northwest. His talk today is titled, Kicking the Commodity Habit, the Re-Decentralization of Grain Growing. Thanks, Alan. <clears throat> um, thank you, Allison. Thank you, Wayne Moore Center, for being here. I, I think it's incredible, so just, just incredible. Um, I'm going to talk about wheat. I could just as easily be talking about malting barley or uh, pickling cucumbers or cabbage for sauerkraut or hops. I'm talking about the commodification of our food and the loss of our ability to grow our regional tastes and foods. Uh, we've seen a lot of maps here in the past few days. This is all the wheat that's grown in the United States. 2008, it's about, it ranges from 40 to 60 million acres. Uh, if it's dark green, there's a lot of wheat there. If it's white, there's no wheat there. Okay, I'm going to come back to this in, in just a moment. But um, if, if you look at uh, eastern Washington, eastern Oregon, there's uh, almost 4 million acres of wheat there. Essentially, all of it goes into the Columbia goes out of Portland and goes out of the country. We export about 95% of the wheat that's grown in the Pacific Northwest. Nationally, we export over 50% of the wheat that's grown in this country is exported. Up until probably the last two years, we never bothered to see how much iron and zinc is in that wheat. We're exporting it to countries that have deficiencies in iron and zinc, and there's tremendous variation in the amount of iron and zinc in our wheats. We never thought to ask, right? We select on yield. And that's it, right? Maybe protein or something like that. But um, 
We've been breeding weed organized in this country since the late 1800s. Okay, this is what wheat looked like in this country in 1919. So I want you to look primarily here. This is the upper, north, upper New England, Maine, Vermont, uh, upstate New York. In Maine, I counted those dots. Each of those dots signify 1,000 acres of one variety of wheat. Uh, in Maine, there are 28 dots there. There's 28,000 acres of wheat in the state of Maine in 1919. Okay, where did that wheat go? It was ground locally and it was eaten and it tasted really good. <laughs> okay. Want to highlight a few areas here. I'm back to 2008 again. I left 1919. Uh, let's look at New England here. Uh, nothing, right? Uh, Vermont and Maine lost their wheat by the 1930s. There was less than 1,000 acres of wheat there. Um, Iowa. Let's go back and look at Iowa here. A lot of black dots. Let's look at Iowa today. There's more wheat in New Mexico than there is Iowa today. There's more wheat grown in Alabama and Florida than there is in Iowa. What's wrong with Iowa? We, we know what's wrong with Iowa. <laughs> I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about these areas here. I also want to go to this county right here in Colorado. This is Route County, Colorado, okay? The little shaded there. Route County has 610 farms with another 503 down valley. That's the Yampa Valley in Moffat County. Farmers are harvesting $344,000 in wheat sales of which none stays for the local milling in use. Okay, are you kidding me, right? Uh, this, this facility here is demonstrate, this is in Route County. This is the haunting of our past and the haunting of our future, right here, okay? This is Hayden Grain Company in Route County, Colorado. Not a single kernel of that grain grown in that county is used locally, okay? What do they use? They use commodity wheat, and I'm gonna talk about that, right? This is a beautiful facility. I'm going there in, in May and this will start. They're going to put a grain mill here and start doing um, uh, wheat there. Uh, Ignacio showed this picture. Here's the full magazine. This is uh, Harper's July 2010. We had a question yesterday on, on uh, someone wanted to know about the food crises. The, the one in 2008 and the current one we're in, how did they happen? The one in 2008 was based entirely on greed. There was no, uh, there were no grain shortages. What's frightening now is there are grain shortages and there's plenty of greed more than ever, okay? Uh, how Goldman Sachs and Wall Street starved millions and got away with it. If you want to learn how your commodity grains that most of you are eating, how they're priced, this is a beautiful article to read. For wheat and, and most of the grains, Kansas City, Chicago, and Minneapolis determine the price of what the wheat that you eat costs, okay? That's incredibly absurd, and I'm going to get into that uh, in just a moment. In March of 2008, spring wheat hit $24 a bushel, double its cost two months ago. You had people starving in Mexico because they couldn't afford corn tortillas based on this. If you get tired of weeding, reading about wheat, you can read about what's the matter with Arizona. <laughs> That's a good story, too. Um, so with, with apologies to Fred, I use local wheat or small wheat. I don't use food shed. When I say uh, wheat, uh, food shed wheat, I get some pretty strange looks, right? So, so I, I like to use the, the word local, although I appreciate the... Uh, the lack of meaning there. So, so I want to I go through some ideas of, of why local wheat, why small wheat as opposed to big commodity, commodity wheat. Number one is, is do you, you want to rent your seed or own it? Okay, for 10,000 years on this planet we've grown wheat. 10,000 years. In our generation, right now, we're taking away that basic right. That's, that's right now. That's, this, that's us in this room doing that. Okay, I don't want to be involved in that. I don't want to be responsible in any way for taking that right away. 
That's what biotech's about, and I'll get into that in just a sec. But, but do you want to rent your seed or own it? And I'll talk about farmers breeding their own seed, and that's the ultimate, uh, that's the ultimate here. Okay. Um, why local? Why small wheat? Why food shed wheat? The growers want it in rotation. This is a biodynamic farm, 200 acres, animal integrated, northeast of uh, Seattle. It's the Jubilee Farm in Carnation. They want wheat because it makes sense in rotation. It makes sense for animal integrated farms. It makes sense for dis breaking disease cycles. It makes sense for adding organic matter. It makes sense, okay? That's why. The growers want it. They don't want to sell their wheat out of Portland. Why local wheat? This is Applegate Valley, just south of here. Is that south? Okay, just south of here, Applegate Valley. Joe and Rosie Rise Up Baker uh, started the Rise Up Bakery in 2008. There are more bakers than there are wheat farmers in Applegate Valley. Uh, that's changing too. Okay, they don't want commodity wheat. They don't want the the wheat that they buy to be priced by Kansas City, Minneapolis, or Chicago. <clears throat> okay, so so how do we how do we work with local wheat with small wheat? Um, we we re decentralize. Uh, this is Whitman County, Eastern Washington. This is the this county produces more wheat than any county in the United States. Okay, not a lot of decentralization there. A hell of a lot of gluten. Um, <laughs> most of the county doesn't even have trees, right? That's not decent. This is big wheat. Okay, this is small wheat. This is Whatcom County. This is also in Washington State. This is uh, just east of Bellingham. That's Mount Baker right there, the Nooksack River draining it. Average farm size in Whatcom County is about 160 acres. This is diversified. This is what it looks like. This is not the past of agriculture. This is how agriculture is going to survive. <laughs> it looks like this as well. So Southern Willamette Valley Bean and Grain Project. Uh, Harry McCormick is going to speak here tomorrow at this conference. Uh, here's a tour bringing bakers and chefs together right in this area. Um, Tom Hutton uh, is in the room today. We went out to his grain mill this morning at 6 o'clock and, and looked at it. It's beautiful. Okay? That's what decentralized grain growing looks like. It looks like this as well. Eby's Prairie, Washington. Uh, you can count probably seven crops on this farm. I'm going to come back to this farm in just a moment. Um, the uh, Port Townsend Ferry is just on the other side of those trees there. <clears throat> this is what it looks like. Back to Applegate Valley, you look at the diversity on that small farm there growing grains. It's what it looks like in France, okay? Um, this is uh, Isabelle Gorgère here. She's a wheat breeder in southern France. In France, it's illegal to to breed your own wheat varieties. It's illegal to grow anything that's not registered. This is my former student here, Julie Dawson. She's working with Isabel. These are four wheat anarchists in France. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, show, I'm gonna show three slides. And we talked about worrying about where the next farmers are coming from. I'm not worried about that, okay? And I'm gonna show you why. And I'm gonna show, I want you to look at these three slides I want you to look around this room, and I want you to look at these, and I want you to see that these people are the same ones that are in this room. They're in Oregon, they're in Washington, and they're in Vermont, okay? This is in Williams, Oregon. This was taken in spring. This is Ryan Dolan's farm. This is Maud Powell here. Uh, she works down in Jefferson and Josephine County. This is a workshop for local growers to learn how to grow, to get grains back into their system. We've lost that ability. We've lost the ability to grow our local grains, okay? She limited these workshops. She had a series of them in the spring to 24 people. Uh, people were crashing it, right? It was like a Doobie Brothers concert, right? Or, or whatever you kids listen to. Now. <laughs> Okay, so that was, that was Southern Oregon. Here's Squim, Washington. This is Nash Huber over here. Olympic Peninsula is in Clallam County. Clallam County has lost 90% of its agriculture in the past 15 years. Basically the only farmer left, right? Animal integrated farm, high value vegetables. He's growing grains for animal feed and for local use. He sells his grains right out of the field to local uh, millers and bakers, okay? Look at the diversity in here. 
little kids, women, all over the board, right? That's the future. That's, these are the people I work with. This makes me excited to be in agriculture, right? I worked in commodity wheat from 1977 to 2007, and I talked to a lot of commodity wheat growers, and they're old white dudes, and they're cranky, okay? <laughs> these, these folks are not, right? <laughs> they're happy, they're interested, and they're interesting, right? Okay, that's squim. Here's northern Vermont, about 10 miles from the Canadian border. This is Jack Laser. You look at those people that I just showed you, and the same ones are right here. Young kids, women, all over the board. This is, this is what agriculture, this is what excites me about agriculture and bringing the grains back into our system. What about the pressures that we feel up and down the I-5 corridor? We've lost our infrastructure, we're losing our farmland at an amazing rate to what? To houses, right? This is north of Everett, right off of I-5. This is John Campbell farming the cul-de-sacs. He has an old reaper and he's growing grains up there, right? Back to that farm in Eby's Prairie. They're pushing the houses back hard on Whidbey Island, and they're doing it by the government, okay? So this is Clark and Wilbur Bishop. Uh, Wilbur here, fourth generation. Clark is third generation. The, the world's record wheat yield 100 years ago was set where? It was set on their farm, 119 bushels per acre, okay? 100 years ago was a world's record wheat yield. The wheat yield today in the state of Kansas is less than 40 bushels per acre. Okay, we don't have to apologize for growing grains up and down the I-5 corridor. We're very good at it. We were very good at it, right? So how are they saving the land? This is a barley field. You see the house there? This, this to their, behind them is Mount Baker. In front of them are the Olympic uh, mountain range. To our, to their left there would be Rainier. This Eby's Prairie would be full of uh, Microsoft retirees, right? 1978, this became the first federal uh, reserve in the nation. It's an agricultural reserve. It would be wall-to-wall -wall houses today, right? They're grain growers. Uh, people in Willamette Valley want to know where their wheat come from, where it comes from. Here you go, okay, right? There's a demand for this, right? Uh, real quick, you guys have a lot of points in Oregon. Uh, <laughs> Eagle Point, uh, the, oldest, the oldest flour mill West of the Mississippi, water-powered is an Eagle Point. The, the first uh, water right was at this mill. Um, I was there three years ago. He was grinding uh, soft white winter. I said, where did it come from? He said, Montana. I said, did you realize your semi went through four million acres of wheat to get that wheat to come back? He said, yeah. I said, did you realize seven miles away is the, is the last farmer in the Rogue River Valley that has 700 acres of wheat? on-farm storage, and he just semied all his wheat up to Oregon, up to Portland to go out to Korea? He said, no, I didn't know that. Okay. Um, it's amazing, right? That was three years ago. Today, they're, they're milling local wheat, right? This Ashland Food Co-op carries that. Uh, Shermansburg, New York, right? I just love that logo. Okay, it's going on there, right? It's going on, it's going on in, in England. So, uh, Hovis is one of the largest bread companies in England. They're worried about, five, six years ago, they're worried about GM wheat, and they're worried about uh, their local farmers losing markets. They got all of their wheat, 100% of it, from Canada and the U.S. Six years ago, five years ago, they decided we're not going to do that. We don't want GM wheat. We want to support our farmers. They work with 600 local farmers. Today, they use 100% British wheat in their uh, baking. Okay. They can do it in Britain. We can do it here easily. Um, getting close to the end here. What are these growers going to use for varieties? What do we do? So I can breed varieties for them. That's what I do. I'm a breeder. How about breeders breeding their own varieties, right? This is Lexi Roach. Her grandfather came to me when she was in junior high school. His son had just died in an accident. He said, I worry about my two granddaughters. It's right what Fred was saying yesterday. I worry about my two granddaughters. I want them to take over the farm. How am I going to do that? I said, have Lexi breed her own wheat variety. He said, that sounds good. Okay, so Lexi came to campus. She went to our greenhouse. We made a cross for her. We decided what, what wheats would do well. The next year, we planted them out on her farm. Each year after that, for the next seven years, she went out in the summer with her grandfather and took, took out of the wheat the, the, line, the type she didn't like and left the type she did like and harvested. She kept doing that uh, for seven or eight years. 
Last year, her wheat, she named it after herself, Lexi II. She had three of them. Number two was the best. She entered it in the Washington State Variety Trial Nursery. This nursery contains 60 varieties of wheat. The best varieties of wheat from Washington State University, Oregon State University, University of Idaho, Monsanto, Syngenta, DuPont, anybody you want to name. The 12 breeding programs are represented in there. Again, Monsanto, Syngenta, on and on. Her variety was the top yielding variety in Douglas County, Washington last year. Okay. A, a junior high school student <laughs> beat Monsanto. <laughs> And, and beat me, too. I had, I had right. <laughs> Okay. She's a junior now at Washington State University. She's on a full-ride Gold Regent Scholarship, $70,000. Everything is paid for her education. Okay. Vermont lost its wheat breeders, uh, lost a wheat breeder in the 1800s. <coughs> Time is up. Okay. Uh, Heather Darby's breeding her own wheat. Jennifer Lapidus went out of business as a baker. She was baking for 20 years. In 2008, she went out of business because she couldn't charge $12 for a loaf of bread. She, she got really pissed. She formed the North Carolina Organic Bread Flour Project. She's working with farmers, millers, and bakers to determine what's a fair price for each of those components of that system, independent of Kansas City, Chicago, and Minneapolis. She does not want to be part of that system, right? Neither do these people. Uh, Amber Lampkin, Skowhegan, Maine. Michael Schultz, a farmer baker. There's another mill that's going up. Uh, their mill is going here in Skowhegan. It's going in the jail. Skowhegan is so depressed economically that even the jail closed, right? Okay, that's, that's where their mill is going. Almost done here. We decentralize our breeding. We also decentralize our baking. Karen Hills, one of my graduate students, is here. She's here right here. Um, we have all types of people here. Uh, we're, we're trying to, to determine if, uh, how these wheats will do, not just on a commercial scale, but also on a home scale, if, if farmers are selling directly to people. Uh, ending right here now, this is George De Pascali at es Essential Baking in Seattle. He uses 20 tons of organic flour uh, per week. He called us and said he wants it from Washington, he wants it from Western Washington. How will it do? That's the big question. There's a lot of folklore that we can't grow bread wheat along the I-5 cor I corridor. Okay, that's, that's pure bullshit, first of all. Um, how does it do? So Karen, my student that's here, she, she milled it, she gave it to, to George. This is from last year. He said, nice controlled acid flavor. This is 100% whole wheat, these loaves here. Uh, grown in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington. He said, nice controlled acid flavors, strong hit of spice, strong hit of chocolate, very easy to work with, very nice flavor, good crumb color, a little tricky in the oven, but well worth it. Best flavor in 33 years of baking. Okay. So, uh, strong hit of spice, strong hit of chocolate. Okay, that's what we're talking about, local wheat, and the regional flavors, right? I've worked in wheat since 77. I've never heard it described with a hit of spice and chocolate. <laughs> right? This is what we're working on. That's my last slide. Um, if you want a small combine, you could build your own. So. <laughs> Final speaker this afternoon is David Cleveland. David is a human ecologist whose research and teach, teaching focus on small-scale sustainable agriculture. He has worked with farmers around the world, including those in Ghana, Mexico, Southwest United States, and Pakistan. His current research includes farmer and scientific knowledge and practice in plant breeding, the genetic, ecological, and sociocultural impact of genetically engineered crop varieties, and the potential impacts of agri-food system localization on climate change, nutrition, and community. He's a professor in the Environmental Studies Program, University of California, Santa Barbara, a member of the Santa Barbara County Agriculture Futures Alliance, and the inaugural UCSB Sustainability Champion. He's also investigating the question of whether localization is a key to food sustainability or a form of greenwashing in Santa Barbara. The title of his talk today is Transgenic Crop Varieties for Small-Scale Farmers, Eliminating Hunger or Eliminating Farmers.
Thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you, Allison, and all the organizers of this uh, great conference. It's an honor to be here. And uh, I hope that I can uh, uh, get as many laughs as, uh, as Steve did. <laughs> Um, we're going to change focus a little bit. We're going to talk more about the international uh, scene here, but uh, much of what uh, I have to say you've heard in, in various forms. Uh, uh, we've heard about how speculators drove up the price of food uh, beginning in, the, in 2008. Uh, the price of food is still going up, but it's recently hit an all-time high. Uh, we have a major food uh, crisis in the world, which doesn't... Uh, look to be getting any better. Uh, this is exacerbated by uh, climate change, which is a huge uh, issue for agriculture. And most, uh, many parts of the world are going to be uh, hard hit. If you notice, uh, uh, this western part of the United States that Steve was talking about is going to be especially hard hit with not only, of course, increasing, uh, uh, decreasing precipitation, but increasing heat. Uh, and we've all heard about the solution uh, from the mainstream consensus, uh, transgenic crop varieties. They're the, going to be the key to solving the world food crisis, uh, to helping small-scale uh, third world farmers, and have no significant risks. Uh, this is an amazing consensus, as you've heard about. Just about every United Nations agency, uh, Major, all major uh, industrial world governments and many foundations. Uh, of course, we know Gates is the big foundation. Uh, the Gates Foundation has pumped billions of dollars into promoting this, uh, this consensus. And of course, then there's the private biotech uh, companies. Uh, as we've also heard, the consensus is basically top-down, market-based, uh, a technological approach. Um, it has a single-minded uh, focus on increasing profits. It's, it's exactly the opposite of what Steve was talking about. It's food for profit. It's food for uh, feeding uh, bodies. I often think, you know, when you see these things, the grand challenges in global health, another a big Gates-funded and uh, uh, effort to promote transgenic crop varieties to eliminate uh, world food hunger. Uh, it's almost as if human beings were just like feeding tubes. And all we needed to do is produce nutrients and food to nourish them. They had no other, uh, no other desires, no other wants. It's the total uh, degradation of human beings to just a, a list of nutrient needs and, and calories. Um, it's really incredible. The consensus is based on untested consumptions. Um, uh, Chuck talked about some of the assumptions the, about the genetics and the uh, agronomy assumptions that are being made. But they're importantly assumptions about farmers, especially uh, farmers in the third world. It, it assumes that farmers are risk neutral profit maximizers. Again, these feeding tubes that all they want to do is get more food, more money. Um, it assumes there's no alternatives to transgenic crop varieties and no uh, adverse consequences. And therefore, most of the research on transgenic crop varieties in the third world has been done by economists who make these kind of assumptions. Uh, it's really, and this is one of my, my main points uh, that I'll make at the end, is that we need more people out there doing research with farmers, not just economists. And these economists, whether it's cotton in India or maize in South Africa or rice in China, it's economists who are doing the research. And these economists are making these basic assumptions and they're, they're driving uh, this consensus about the need for transgenic crop varieties. For example, and it's, it's amazing the kind of research that's done. Uh, they'll ask farmers, this is a very common thing, oops, sorry. Uh, they ask farmers, uh, do you have an insect problem? Yeah, are there insects eating your, your crop? Well, sure there are. Oh, well, um, gosh, we'll, we'll run back to the laboratory and we'll create some kind of BT uh, 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 maize or sorghum or, or something that was resistant to these 
And we don't need to ask you whether you want this crop because you've already told us you have an insect problem. And this is the kind of logic. It is a total, uh, uh, a total uh, disenfranchisement of the farmers from the right to make decisions about what, what they would like to grow and how they would like to farm. I, it's come to me, you know, reading Naomi Klein's a wonderful book called Disaster, uh, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. It reminds me very much of exactly what's going on with our uh, transgenic crop industry. Uh, yeah, and I, I like the term disaster genetics because it's based on exactly the same kind of scenario that Naomi Klein laid out for uh, capitalism in the world. Naomi Klein talks about how, how uh, the uh, rise of, of neoclassical economics, the Milton Friedman Chicago School and the Berkeley School, uh, use natural disasters to promote economic disasters which push people to the point where they're willing to have their freedom, their uh, choice of what kind of wheat they want to eat taken away from them. These disasters are used to convince us that we should not raise our heads because uh, things are just really dire. Now, most of the time, uh, you know, we have these pictures uh, on Monsanto's website of, of people in the third world, women smiling and and harvesting, and they want to help small farmers. But what the real thing is, this is just a front game, the real game is that they want to eliminate these farmers. And sometimes they come right out and say it, as these two quotes here uh, uh, demonstrate. The goal is to eliminate small-scale third world farmers. Uh, the, uh, Joseph Schumpter's idea of creative destruction uh, is often cited by these economists. This consensus, of course, is part of the same thing that other speakers have talked about in terms of the uh, uh, dominant economic policy that's already undermining farmers. And I have some examples uh, here from Mexico. Uh, since the start of uh, the NAFTA quota is here, but look what Mexico's been importing. Mexico now uh, currently, this is the current year, Mexico is importing about 30% uh, of its maize needs. This is, the, this is the country where maize was domesticated, where most people in Mexico, uh, rural farmers, eat corn every day. They have tortillas every day. This is the staff of life in Mexico. Uh, but look at the price. This is what uh, uh, Keith Aoki talked about uh, in a session before this. Look at the price. Farmers are being disfranchised. Uh, while U.S. farmers are being subsidized. This has led to increased migration. Uh, the migration rates are, uh, uh, have gone up, of course, in Mexico. Um, we have 66% uh, in these uh, four, uh, eight communities. We said it in the uh, Sierra Norte, in the, in the Central Valleys, in Oaxaca, um, these migrants were farmers before they left. And in the, in the session uh, before this, we talked, uh, some of the speakers were talking about how we need to uh, help migrants, Latino migrants in this country, become farmers. But stop and think they were farmers before they came here. So what we really need to do is to make farming a viable way of life for farmers in Mexico so they don't have to come uh, to the United States to farm. Because, we need to do this because the diversity uh, in Mexico is being lost with these farmers. Uh, you can see from this, uh, these are other data from our, oops, these are uh, other data from our research that show uh, Look at the change in, in uh, maize varieties grown per household, in bean varieties grown per household in these uh, eight communities in the uh, Sierra Norte and the Central Valleys, 
and the change in maize area growing. So we have loss of genetic diversity, not only in the number of varieties, but as the size of the area planted uh, decreases, these open pollinated crops and even beans cross pollinated, the loss of diversity from smaller and smaller populations also uh, increases. But what we also have here is a loss of culture and community. Uh, it's, when you stand in a field with a farmer, and as, as uh, I and my colleagues have done in our research in Mexico, and the farmers will look out over the field, and it'll be so beautiful, in the morning especially, and you look out over a field of maize, and you see the purple tassels, and the yellow tassels, and the rust-colored tassels, the violet tassels, and the dew is on the maize, and the sun slanting through, and it's just beautiful. And the farmers have a, they love, they love what they do, they love the, look out over these beautiful fields and they'll say, yes, but it's very sad. It's very sad because I have ten children and nine of them are living in the United States. And my grandchildren don't even speak Zapotec, which is the language of our village. So we're losing a lot of, uh, we're losing a lot by this uh, consensus policy, which is part of this uh, whole economic policy. So, what are the alternatives to this? Are small-scale farmers the alternative? I think uh, Steve's already answered that question for us. But are they the question, are they the, the uh, uh, answer in the third world? What's important, unlike the, the economists who have done probably over 90% of the research that's been published on small-scale farmers and transgenic crop varieties in the third world, these are the papers that come out in science uh, and nature and so on. Um, these papers uh, by these economists never talk to farmers. They never empower farmers. If you read the rhetoric that, come, that, that goes along with this, if you talk uh, the rhetoric on the Monsanto website and so on, they talk about, uh, Bill Gates even gave a talk a couple years ago. He said he wanted to really empower small-scale farmers. But if you look at the actual research that's done, these farmers are not empowered but they want to and can participate in very uh, substantive ways. <laughs> yeah, let's clap for those small scale farmers. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've done, a, over, the, over uh, uh, the last decade or so, we've been involved in doing research, uh, my wife Daniela Soleri and I and colleagues around the world uh, working in different countries uh, and uh, especially in, in southern Mexico. And farmers are able to understand very complicated things that most plant breeders think that they, you know, come on, they're just farmers. They're illiterate. Uh, there's a famous uh, maize breeder at Simit who was a maize breeder at Simit for 30 years. He couldn't speak Spanish and he'd never been in a milpa. He didn't need to. He understood the answers. Uh, but when you ask farmers, they understand um, some very uh, complex well, maybe not so complex for them. Um, we ask farmers, for example, what, they, uh, what kind of variety they prefer. Now, the, the assumption, as I said, but of, the of the consensus about transgenic crop varieties, oh, two minutes, oh my gosh. Okay, uh, we ask farmers, uh, the consensus is that farmers are profit maximizers. There are these feeding tubes, you just want to accumulate more, right? Uh, when you ask farmers, um, they don't want that. Farmers don't want the responsive maize that has an overall higher uh, yield. You can see this kind of maize has a higher overall yield, but it's more responsive. In other words, it has higher variation through environments, through space and time. Farmers understand this. They are risk averse. They're not risk neutral. They live in tough environments and they uh, they understand that they need to be risk averse so that they don't end up here with these uh, modern varieties uh, with nothing. 83% of the uh, farmers in those eight communities favored uh, this stable variety, this, this one, which is most, most like a farmer's traditional varieties. Farmers also understand the difference between technology and its consequences unlike a lot of uh, scientists in this country, 
who don't seem to understand the difference between technology and its consequences. Um, we asked them, for example, is, transgenes is transgenesis in maize acceptable per se? In other words, we describe to them transgenesis in a very neutral way. Uh, it's something you take from plant, other plants or animals and you put in uh, a maize plant and it makes the insects die that try to eat it. And we, we try to be very neutral, uh, even positive in our description. And you know what? 50%, 7% of the farmers in, in Oaxaca said, yes, give us that transgenic type. Well, we didn't describe it as transgenic. They said, give us this stuff. We, the yields in Oaxaca are about 0.8 tons per, per hectare. In the United States, they're 8 tons per hectare, 10 times what. I mean, these farmers are in, uh, it's, it's not easy. So, yeah, they're saying, hey, look, we're, we're open. We'll take that technology. But when you ask people about the consequences, 90% did not like the hypothetical consequences of adopting transgenic type varieties. Uh, they didn't want to depend on the market for seed. Uh, as you saw, they didn't want, um, they didn't want uh, a variety with high variation through time. And farmers also conserve this cultural and crop genetic diversity. Synergistic, this is part, this diversity is part of their, um, part of their culture, part of their life, part of what they value in life. Uh, as we see in this example of Tejate, where you can, I don't know if you can see this, but farmers, uh, farm households, Tejate is a traditional drink in Oaxaca made with a maize and, ch and chocolate and uh, blossoms from trees and seeds from fruit and so on. And it's been done for uh, a long time there. Farmers in households, uh, farm households who uh, make tahate, who make it more regularly and who use more different varieties of corn are also those farmers who conserve more crop genetic diversity. So, what are the conclusions? The, the consensus being promoted by the United States government, by Bill Gates, by Monsanto, uh, by the United Nations, uh, it's not democratic. It doesn't ask farmers what they want. And it's not scientifically sound. It's not based on a scientific understanding of what farmers want and what farmers know. So it's not scientific and it's not democratic. Small-scale farmers are not risk-neutral profit maximizers. There's a lot more to life for those farmers than they want more food, but there's a lot more to life than that. They can and they want to participate and they can serve valuable genetic diversity and we need more research. We gotta get out there and do this research because the economists are, are, are controlling it. They're doing all the research and they're coming up with results that say, look, all those Chinese cotton farmers, look, they're so much happier now growing BT cotton. Look, those farmers in, in South Africa growing uh, white uh, transgenic maize, they're so much better off. We've got to get out there and do the research with these farmers, empower these farmers to have a voice in this debate or the consensus is going to uh, dominate the day and we can't let it do that because the consequences are too dire. Thank you. So I'd like to invite the panelists to come up to the table and we'll take some questions. We really want to try to bring some dialogue. I know we're coming close, but I think we can run over a few minutes. And so um, what I'd like to encourage you to do, first of all, is speak very loudly. If you don't, we'll try to repeat your questions. But I think if people speak loudly, it may be broadcast. If you give me a signal that we need to repeat it, we'll do that. Um, and also, to keep these short, I would like to invite to have, let's get three questions on the floor, and then you, if you want to direct them to one of the panelists, you may, but I'd like to get a dialogue between the panelists, each other, and the, and the audience. So um, first question, and then we'll, we'll get two more, and then we'll discuss those three. Yeah, go ahead. Um, my question's for anyone on the panel would like to answer. 
I've been thinking this morning, we, we talked a bit about, you know, sort of the, the power and the influence that these large corporations have on, you know, whether it's McDonald's influencing a Kennedy case or, or on Santo and a brain ego. Um, how do we, because I think what you're promoting is so wonderful, but it seems to be so at odds with, you know, this, this majority opinion. How do we, how do we engage those, those power holding corporations and a different dialogue and, you know, what are your thoughts for, how, how we engage that um, that process is just so challenging to come up against, you know, those powerful things. Okay, thank you. So the first question is, how do we engage corporations in the dialogue to, to make this change? Briefly. second question is, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it seems as though if indeed after a, basically a decade of market penetration of transgenic commodity crops, they are indeed starting to show their weaknesses and indeed fail, that there's a great opportunity for uh, Seed companies for the market forces to bring in essentially standard breed seeds back <laughs> into the marketplace. Clearly, farmers are greatly vulnerable right now. How do we do this? How do we retransform that system in 10, 12 years? And what's the role of farm supply companies? Or where are those barriers in doing so if indeed it's not working? Okay. Third question right here How would you scale up community based and farm kind of seed banks and seed saving opportunities? particularly in, a con in the U.S. or elsewhere in a context where it seems to be maybe not um, laws that are stopping it, but lawsuits that can be stopping it. How do you scale up seed banks in the face of laws or lawsuits? So, yeah. uh, I'd like to talk about engaging. Um, I don't want to engage with them, actually, and I don't know if that's selfish or not, but... That we oftentimes we ask the people that caused the problems to help us fix them, and and I'm I'm tired of engaging with them actually. So I don't know if that's a good answer or not. I I, I gave a talk at Monsanto headquarters a couple of years ago because of the work we did with uh, transgenic maize and gene flow in in Mexico, and and uh, they listened very politely, and then they took me into a little room. Uh, after <laughs> they took me into, like, they fed me lunch, uh, and then they took me into a little room, and there were about three or four Monsanto people, executives in there, were the international uh, program people. And, you know, they said, Well, what's wrong? We want to help the farmers in Mexico and Latin America. And I said, Well, you know, one thing you could really do is you could, you could issue a statement, legally binding statement, that you would not. Uh, uh, prosecute any farmers like you have in North America, for example, who inadvertently end up with a trans gene in their crop that they didn't pay for. And they said, oh gosh, we'd love to do that, but our lawyers wouldn't let us. <laughs> That's why you can't really engage with these people. They're working on a whole different paradigm. The uh, solution to that the seed industry and biotech industry are pursuing to deal with glyphosate-resistant weeds is to breed into uh, corn, cotton, and soybean cultivars resistance to essentially all of the other major families of herbicide chemistry. We're going to have a, 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 a virtual explosion of herbicide use across the uh, southeast and, and in the corn belt uh, you know, if the USDA um, approves these multiple uh, herbicide tolerant plants. And, and, I describe it as the, you know, the, the logic of, of dealing with um, glyphosate-resistant weeds and the breakdown of the Roundup Ready system by breeding additional herbicide tolerance. It's like pouring gasoline on a fire to put it out. The three more questions. Oh, the, well, the seed bank we didn't answer. I okay, think you good. breed your own varieties. There are plenty of public uh, lines out there. People in this room are breeding their own varieties. That's one way. Okay. Yeah. I have a question about the uh, Food Safety Modernization Act that was just passed by the Senate. Uh, it was like S510. I've been reading a lot of uh, conflicting reviews if that was a positive thing for small farmers or a negative thing for small farmers. I was wondering if you could get an impression from you guys about that. Okay, so the first question is about the Food Safety Act. Second one. Yes, we've talked a lot about the change in nutrition in genetically modified organisms, and I was wondering what your opinions were about how that's impacting not only nutrients, but our bodies. I feel like I'm a human experiment, uh, and our entire generation is eating, consuming uh, seeds and foods that 
are genetically modified without us even knowing about it. So what impact does that have on our bodies and our children's bodies? Okay, so the second question is about impact on human bodies from eating genetically modified food. One more. Yeah. So the, the, the final question is about, from a student from Iowa in sustainable agriculture, how do we work with science to solve some of these problems? So panelists, please. Um, I'll, I'll start on, uh, on the food safety bill. Um, I think it's a tremendous step forward. I was glad that Senator Tester of Montana was able to yeah, get, get the exemption for farmers growing up to $500,000 worth of uh, produce, which will shield most small-scale farmers from the impact of, of the bill. Uh, it's long overdue. The industrialization of the vegetable fruit side of the food system have created some very substantial food safety risks that have not been dealt with in a responsible way, and I, I think the legislation is a, a good step in, in the right direction. Um, on the issue of the integrity of science, um, I've, I've been speaking out about this for, for uh, a long time, and uh, I, I think that we've, if we don't take science back, uh, we are truly going to, to, to lose the, the great good that, that can come from, from knowledge and, and, and technology. I mean, not all technology is bad, uh, but uh, science has been hijacked in, in the United States, and the dismantling of the public role in science uh, makes it now that the, the the most voices and the loudest voices are all uh, coming from um, institutions and 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 um, and agribusiness and and for anybody that stands up against that, I mean, look, look at this panel: Ignacio, Stephen, and I. We've we all have some pretty major scars from standing up against that system. And you know, there's a lot of people that uh, um, when when the system, when agribusiness went after them, they, they just got out of it. They just said, I, I don't want to work in this anymore. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very, very serious problem. And, and I, I think we've got to, sp we've got to say, it, it, it's beyond the time where we say we need more research. We, I'm not saying that anymore. There's a lot of research we don't need more of. We have to start talking about the kind of research we do, and how we uh, preserve the integrity of, of science. We have, a, we have a, a lot more ability to do that in this country because the average person has a lot more uh, clout in this country. Uh, in, in the third world, uh, this isn't the case. Uh, and that's where I think it's very critical. Uh, the Gates Foundation and other foundations, for example, are, are, are funding a project called the Think Tank Initiative, which, which in, in poor countries uh, commandeer with, goes in with money and commandeers uh, lo local NGOs that are basically neoclassical economic uh, th uh, organizations to propagandize. They, they get fund people to go into legislatures in Kenya and elsewhere to promote their a vision of the future, in other words, to promote transgenic crop varieties. So, so we really need to, to, to be aware of the rest of the world as well of, as of the United States. Um, thank you. I, 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 I failed to um, address both the human question because to say that these so-called technologies are not working doesn't, doesn't do justice to what's actually happening out there because the release of these organisms out into the environment does have consequences, whether 
it has the consequences that the people who are releasing them intended is another question. They, know, they don't. And we unfortunately don't have the science that would be necessary to know what's happening to your body, as you asked. Uh, we haven't done that research. There is a lot of research that I think would be really good to do, but we're, what we're talking about is what we haven't done. I think uh, talking about the negatives, the things that did not happen, the things that were put in the back burn burner back in the 1930s when all this was happening, there's so much science that was just pushed aside because we needed to pursue this one strategy. So I agree with Chuck that there is a lot of retrieval, that lot of recovery. Uh, just like we need to recover the seed, the information in the seeds, we need to recover all that information in ourselves that has gone missing, that is gone. And I'm afraid that we can't live without science. This assumption that we have a university system that will, we will always have labs that work. There are people who say, oh, let's do open source biology, everybody in the factory, and so on. It, it's not the same thing. Uh, so the assumption of this university, for example, the assumption of this center, is a bad assumption which cannot take ourselves for granted. And we cannot take the knowledge that we need for granted. And we just need to start re digging it up, just like people need to dig up the seeds. Um, because I think there is a point where justice that tends to be defined simply as justice for an individual, for individual people. So I think we have been convinced, I think uh, Fred did a really good job last night of convincing us that there is a point where justice becomes environmental activism where justice really expands over to non-humans, to things that we will not meet, like uh, Annelise was saying to the panel before, uh, things that we won't, even, we won't even have names for. How do we accommodate that? And that is what has been broken, I think, by the infusion of transgenesis in the living world as well as in the intellectual world. For the, the woman from Iowa, state that want to know about what we can do scientifically for sustainability. Um, I'm a molecular cytogeneticist. I, I did my work in Davis in the 80s when we thought biotech would solve everything. We found out it soon wouldn't. Um, it, it's not the practice, it's the practitioners. It, that's what happened with it. But um, at, at my research center, we have 17 graduate students, mostly PhDs. I have six PhDs of my own. Uh, most of my students go in the lab, they isolate DNA, they use markers, they do things like that. We don't do transgenesis, we don't commercialize what we do. There's plenty of room for, for science in sustainable agriculture and, and in organic. Of the 17 graduate students at the center, every single one of them has their project geared towards sustainability of, of small-scale agriculture in western Washington, and all six of mine as well. Most of those have organic components as well. So, there's plenty of room for a lot of science. It's who, who's determining what science is done, and is that determination commercial, or is it designed with the growers for their long-term best interest in heart? That, that's what's at, at stake, is, is who's deciding what science is done. There, there's plenty to do, there are plenty of people to do it. The graduate students that I deal with are incredible. The, the future is very bright scientifically. Thank you. Well, let's thank our panelists. We're out of time.